Okay, in my summation, I'm going to look at three areas. First of all, I'm going to deal with the stuff about soft, soft influence that came out of close to opposition, explain why it's not relevant to debate, and I'm also compared to that to Kate's extension about why legalism is important, judicial precedent is important, and you can't just opt out of specific measures of constitutions. Secondly, though, um, I'm going to deal with sort of the more general stuff we've heard on the proposition line on um, why, why, why there are problems in the Supreme Court, deal with that on a comparative basis, explain how we're clearly winning on our side, then thirdly, I'm going to speak to you about, again, the stuff that we heard about why we think courts are more pro-majority in general, again, focusing on the stuff that Kate brought to you about expediency and rights and what those actually are. Okay, so firstly, on this sort of, uh, on, on, on this sort of stuff that we heard about soft power. Like, what we have proposed in proposition is a sort of, it's actually really great when, when courts announce that something is incompatible without having to actually strike down the law because then the government can be pressured into not doing that. I mean, notice that that didn't actually take place within the model that was set up by a proposition, which is not courts announcing that something is incompatible. It's rather courts saying, this is something we believe to be incompatible. So public, what do you think? Right? And that's the issue with the case that we heard with the proposition. Because we say, like, insofar as soft power courts might work under the moment or might have any degree of respect, it's on the grounds that people defer to their authority when they come out and say something is incompatible rather than think of it as an issue for public discussion. We say it's very easy for governments to just resist any power that they like currently have under the status quo if they can just expect the people to back them, because then it's people plus government versus all judges. You claim that that is a legitimate avenue. That's the thing that we disagree with on side opposition. This with Kate's stuff about why this is important. And, 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 and particularly that the, the legalism is important. We actually think debates about whether or not you have a right to an abortion in a country should not be about your personal feelings about whether you think something is morally right or morally wrong, but rather what rights to privacy do you have in a society in which there is a lot of divided opinion about whether or not abortion is right or wrong. So when Tommy stands up in his speech and says, we don't think this discussion should be just legalistic, we think it should like actually be about the issues that people have faced, we just fundamentally disagree. These aren't about like hot topic governing issues in a society. Because you might think that abortion is a wrong thing, but you also think that people in your society in general have a right to live free of oppression, and you don't want to be conflating those two issues in a big referendum when the stakes are high and people have lots of personal issues. You've no guarantee on what basis people are voting, and it's probably going to be the wrong one we say when you take this little referendum to the people. In particular, though, it, this role just in general, right, includes a huge amount of ambiguity to what a constitution even is, right? Because this was Kate's stuff, right, about the 1847. It is not clear, right, if you, if, if there's a law that exists, right, and it gets brought to the court, and the court says, we think this is unconstitutional, then there's a referendum, and people don't get the truth that the majority needed to take down the law. I mean, does that mean the constitution has changed? Because you haven't agreed on any general principle about what might be different. You haven't agreed on any general principle about what rights might have fundamentally been affected. You just say that we're happy with this law. That's the issue with not having a legalistic basic CD discussion. That's an issue about just being able to randomly opt out of more general human rights. What do we see as the role of constitutional courts, ladies and gentlemen? We say that you you sign up to them because you recognize that they guarantee certain fundamental protections, right? The right to privacy, the right to equality, the right to, the right to individual dignity. And the point is that means you might not agree with every individual decision that the constitutional court makes on any individual topic, but you think there is a broader framework here, and that in general you support that broader framework, and that, 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 that would get online if you just pick and choose, you know, which minorities you're happy to have these rights and which minorities you think they aren't. It undermines the more general principle which you think people do agree to, <coughs> do consent to, and that, that cannot function in your system. I'll take a close end by. All I've got between two million and is cause to start with more. Okay? When courts do decide against public, uh, public opinion, as they do in America at the moment, see Hobby Lobby, what happens with the good to do this court then? Uh, uh, like, we think it's perfectly legitimate. Like, we think, we think it might be that some people are angry that the court's acted this way. Notice, though, the courts do have to publish justification for their decisions. And their justification is very commonly, for example, Lawrence v. Texas, when they struck down sodomy schools in the UA. Like, you might not agree with homosexuality, but there's a guaranteed right to privacy within the US Constitution, which means the law goes on between consenting adults and it does not pose significant harm to society, is quite frankly none of your business and none of the business of the law. Maybe not everyone's convinced by that in these cases, but we think fundamentally the more important thing is that gay people stop going to prison for having sex. Okay. Second area of passion about the problems, right? So ultimately, like, what were the problems? Like, we had this idea that, like, some constitutions 
trying to do opt through. One thing I really want to make very clear, like the model is that you need a two-third majority, right, in order to like in order to get the oppressive law gone, right? So it's not even like you need two-thirds. You want no, 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 no. We asked for a clarification. That's what it was. Two-thirds need to be get to strike the law down, right? So that means in their cases that they want to talk about, like Sri Lanka, right? You would have to have a liberal government pushing through a pro-Tamil law, which the Supreme Court, which is an entirely anti-Tamil said is unconstitutional, and then two-thirds of the Sri Lankan people would have to side with the Tamils, rise against the constitutional court, in order to possibly work in any type of the way that you think it would. And so, like, that, that is just not fundamentally the, 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 the balances that we would see in society in terms of majoritarianism. We say in general that if population is anti-minority, then the parliament tends to be anti-minority too, and they all work together in the courts of the independent check on that. I think the most important stuff was about political interference at this point, right? And the idea that they're just politically pointed, but you can't get to it. But we say, look, there are internal pressures in these circumstances. Like, in particular, right, if you're, if you're, if like, if they said they could just do it on any basis, not even a legalistic one. First of all, recognize these, these people have a huge amount of prestige and legal experience, and they're not going to take their jobs lightly, in general. But secondly, if you are just being political, if you are just striking down decisions just for the sake of it, then you're not completely immune from pressure, right? So in the 1930s, when the Supreme Court in America was striking down FTR's, like, New, new Deal legislation, then there was a threat, right, by the government to massively expand the pool of judges on the court. Um, and that, that caused them to stop striking down this legislation. Like, this doesn't mean they're not independent, but it does mean that if they're acting like ridiculously political ways that have no legal basis, then in that very rare case you can get government intervention and that acts as enough of a deterrence to stop that happening in any significant case. Finally, though, where they're pro minority in general, because what, what, what we said, right, with those opposition, is that when you look at the fundamental rights, then those are things that you can draw on, applying more of a case, right? This is why, like, even like Scalia, who's like super voted to take down Proposition 8 because he thought there was a fundamental imposition on the democratic rights of people to be governed um, like, through, through like, jurisdictions for a referendum was an unfair way to go about that. But furthermore, stuff like the right to privacy, the right to equality, and, and safeguards against expediency in particular, treating people as ends and not means, uh, and means and not ends, and populism is what really makes these courts, in general, fake for minority, even if they don't get any rights, they're better. We beg to post.